Welcome to the Ancient Christian Writer series, led by Father David Abernethy at the Oratory of St. Philip Neri in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The following recording is a reading and discussion of the ascetical homilies of St. Isaac the Syrian. Our ability to provide podcasts free of charge is made possible by the generosity of listeners like you. If you would like to make a contribution in support of our ministries, please visit www thepittsburgoratory.org. Your interest and prayerful support are appreciated. God bless you and enjoy the podcast. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Hey, welcome back to the Ancient Christian Writer Series, and for all those who are new, welcome to the group for the first time, as well as those who are listening by podcast. Uh, this is now, we're moving into, we're closing in on the fourth year of this group. Prior to calling it the Ancient Christian Writer Series, it was called the Classics of Western Spirituality, uh, but we found ourselves reading so many of the Eastern Fathers that it seemed wiser to change the title. Uh, Our specific attempt over these past four years has been to immerse ourselves in the great writers of the Eastern tradition, uh, especially those writers whose works have been compiled in a work called the Philokalia, or what is commonly known as the Love of the Beautiful. And uh, we started out four years ago by looking at the general themes of the Eastern writers, how they looked at the human person, how they approached the spiritual life and the ascetical life. And we spent a certain number of months just trying to familiarize ourselves with their language so that we could enter into the texts more fully. Uh, We then moved on to one of the great writers from the the East, uh, St. John Climacus, who wrote the work Ladder of Divine Ascent. And then from him, we moved on to St. John Cassian, who wrote the conferences. Uh, He was a Western monk who then went to Egypt with a friend named Germanus. They lived with Eastern monks for many years and then brought this wisdom from the East back to the Western monasteries uh, into what would be uh, uh, present-day France. Uh, And from there, we're moving now to uh, St. Isaac the Syrian, uh, who lived in the 7th century. And... uh, We try to approach this group as a kind of group Lexio Divina, uh, a slow meditative reading of the text, uh, approaching it as we would approach scripture. So our purpose isn't speed here or information. It's really to allow uh, God as well as these writers and their wisdom to speak directly to our hearts. And so to slowly unpack it and to read it verbatim, And uh, especially with the last work, which was close to 900 pages, it seemed uh, a daunting task to do so and maybe laborious. But in the end, it proves to be very fruitful. We have a tendency, I think, in our day now, especially uh, you're trained in the universities, to skim and to read very quickly. And we've lost that skill of being able to engage in Lexio, uh, of the slow prayerful kind of reading, and uh, so the last work took, took us nearly th- three years to get through, and this might be true for St. Isaac as well, and that's fine by me. Uh, it, it proves to be far more rich in doing so. Uh, I think we're fortunate in being able to read it in this way, too, to hear every word uh, read out loud and then to be able to discuss it as, as a group, to unpack it, look at things that are difficult, try to understand what the author was addressing, especially for writers who were writing for monks and writing many centuries ago to uh, try to apply the wisdom to our day-to-day life living within the world. And uh, their writings are deeply rooted in the scriptures, and so uh, to allow ourselves to be formed uh, in the way that they were, with pure hearts that can uh, allow ourselves then to uh, live out the gospel as fully as possible. Uh, 
I want to try, try a little bit different tactic here this time with Isaac the Syrian. In the past, I've gone through lengthy introductions of who they were and their themes and how they approached uh, their writings. I really want just to allow Isaac to speak for himself as much as possible. And I think most of us here are familiar with the basic themes, how they approach uh, uh, their understanding of the spiritual life, how they approach their understanding of God. And so I think we can give ourselves a little bit of leeway at this point. And if we need to come back to things and discuss them again, that, that's fine. But uh, I don't want the first group to be laborious. I want us to jump right into the first homily of St. Isaac. We don't know much about St. Isaac anyways, so it would be uh, a rather boring group to try to spend an hour talking about him. We don't know when he was born exactly or when he died exactly. That's sometime within the seventh century uh, in what would be present-day Iraq. Uh, and uh, even among Eastern Christians, uh, they would have been very uh, isolated uh, in terms of living out the faith and deeply persecuted. It's a very ancient church going back to the first century. Syriac is uh, an Aramaic dialect. And so their translations of the gospel would have actually been closer to Christ's own teaching than what we find in the Greek. And so it's a very ancient church, one that right from the beginning was, as I said, deeply persecuted. Uh, they engaged first the Jews of the Persian Empire. In fact, they stayed engaged uh, with the Jewish community a lot longer than Western Christians. And then they en engaged the uh, people of the, of the Persian Empire, and the, so the main religion would have been Zoroastrianism, and uh, which sort of believed in a one God, creator God, and, uh, and emphasized sort of the free will of the human person. But this is what they were dealing with until the rise of Islam uh, much later. But uh, nonetheless, they were deeply persecuted. Uh, there's a little bit of a struggle, and you'll see it as we go through uh, some of the history that it it's often wondered if Isaac and this church in Syria, which is called the Church of the East, uh, was Nestorian. That there's a question whether or not they were heretical in their understanding of the nature of Christ, of his human and divine nature, and how those two are, were united. And uh, the main teacher from this uh, area of the world was uh, Theodore of Mopsuestia. <laughs> I think I have pronounced that correctly. I hope I did. But uh, he's known as the great interpreter, that their uh, focus in their uh, study in the, uh, of, of theology was scripture. And so he uh, really spent his whole lifetime interpreting the scripture, and, was, and he was revered so deeply that uh, he becomes the guide for this whole Christian tradition and the development of what was called the Persian school. And it was there that their the theology, their under understanding of scripture, lit liturgical tradition began to develop. And it was all unique uh, because of the uniqueness of the language and being cut off from other Christians uh, because of being part of the Persian Empire, that uh, the language is unique. And this is what causes a problem that they develop uh, an articulation of, who, of Christ's nature in a way that was different from the early councils of the church in the West. And a big part of it had to do with language. And so there was a rejection even of some of the early councils. The Council of Chalcedon sought to rectify this and uh, uh, politically uh, because certain members from the uh, Syrian church were not involved, or those who were part of the Antiochian school weren't involved in this discussion, that council was rejected, and so that reconciliation never took place at that, at that point. 
Uh, and again, part of it was the struggle with language. Things could have been uh, taken care of with that council, and there would have been nothing within the council's teaching that the Syrian church would have obje objected to. It's just they could not wrap their mind around the Greek language and the meaning behind the words, that it seemed illogical the, the, the way the Church of the West was trying to describe the relationship between the divine and human nature of Christ. Uh, Isaac uh, arises during what was considered the golden age of the Syrian church. That would have been from like the 6th to the 8th century in Syria. And he would have been formed by Theodore's uh, teaching on scripture. Uh, he was a, a consecrated a bishop, and that lasted for about a month or two, and then he said that's it, and went off and lived the life of an anchorite with other anchorites until he was so old and had read and embraced the life of asceticism that was so deep that he started to go blind, and then he had to connect himself to a monastery. <laughs> and that's when he writes these, these homilies. But they're universally revered that even though the Syrian church was somewhat isolated, that uh, Isaac's writings have been translated. He's the one from this golden age that is remembered from the Syrian church. And so uh, on Mount Athos today, Isaac is perhaps the most read spiritual writer. And it is Isaac's writings that were uh, instrumental in the revitalization of monasticism in Russia. So highly revered there as well. Uh, we're very fortunate uh, to be able to read him in English. It's only recently that uh, good translations have become available. And so we have a lot to be grateful to this monastery for because they, they struggled for years trying to put together translations uh, from the Greek and other texts and couldn't do it. Things seemed nonsensical and didn't uh, sort of connect. And so they uh, had one of their guys learn Syrian uh, in order to be able to translate this for us. And so we're the beneficiaries of that. So this book is less than 10 years old. I think it was 2009 when they, they translated it. So uh, we're very fortunate to have access to it. The style of writing is a little different from what we've looked at in the past. Uh, St. John Climacus, if you remember, had 30 steps of his ladder of divine ascent, uh, very methodical, very clear. Same thing with Cassian's conferences, uh, very clear on their, their focus and intention. Uh, these are uh, homilies, uh, a little bit longer than what we're used to, uh, certainly, and there is a thread that runs through them. But uh, sometimes he'll focus on one thing that will be a theme of the spiritual life in one paragraph and then move to something different. And there's a thread that connects it, but I think we're going to have to stop off and listen to what he has to say and, and then move on and be fine with that and not uh, be pressing him to be as uh, logical or systematic is the word I'm looking for, systematic in his thinking as some of the other writers. Um, it's been said that if all the writings of the fathers of the East were lost, that if only Isaac the Syrian's writings remained, a person could move from the state of a beginner to perfection that his understanding of stillness, of silence, of solitude, of prayer is so rich and so deep that he captures the essence of the whole spiritual tradition of, of the East. And uh, so it will be a great opportunity, again, uh, I think, to go through this after we've already looked at, at two very rich works. Okay. Any questions before we begin about Isaac? or anything that I've said. No? Okay. Let's begin with homily one. We're beginning on page 113 
And I just want to draw your attention right at the beginning to the little footnote at the bottom of the page. And the authors tell us that actually the first six homilies uh, were connected as one under the title of On the Discipline of Virtue. And uh, it has subsequently been broken up into six different homilies. But uh, this is the gist of the first six that we'll be reading. Uh, what is the discipline of virtue? What are the main characteristics of, of that discipline? And tonight we'll be looking in particular at renunciation. But it said in the, this first one in particular, we'll see the, the themes that we'll be looking at through the rest uh, of the homily. So we'll want to be uh, listening pretty closely here uh, to this first, first homily. Uh, as always, don't hesitate to, to stop and uh, ask a question or make a comment. Uh, again, we're in no hurry. Okay, page 113, homily number one on renunciation and the monastic life. The fear of God is the beginning of virtue, and it is said to be the offspring of faith. It is sown in the heart when a man withdraws his mind from the attractions of the world to collect its thoughts, wandering about from distraction into reflection upon the restitution to come. So virtue we see here, see here and hear from Isaac right from the beginning is rooted in silence. And uh, again, this isn't something that we would often think about in modern times, the, especially in the West. Uh, uh, often a social gospel has predominated and that this is what sort of forms our understanding of the spiritual life that in many ways we've moved away from uh, the focus on the formation of the interior life of the heart. And, but Isaac, like so many of the Eastern Fathers, uh, draws us inward and says no, you know, that our formation of Christians begins with uh, turning towards God and seeking purity of heart through the purification of the passions in order that we might be more and more free from our sin and open to the grace of God in order to be able to live the gospel. Fully, and that this is not something that can be neglected. And the arena, if you will, where this is fostered is silence. That we have to silence, uh, uh, seek silence both in an external and internal way. Externally in our lives by uh, removing ourselves from things that are pure distraction. And we have plenty of those in our day, that even though we live in the world and we understand that we have to work and engage in relationships and uh, be active in many different ways, that we will often distract ourselves and expose ourselves to the noise of the world. And we do it in, to such an extent that we can no longer hear God. And so one of the first steps f for us, uh, I think, is to foster this external silence, to look at our lives and say, how, how can I bring a kind of simplicity to my life? And what choices do I have to make uh, in order to foster a kind of life where a true and deep intimacy with God can develop? I'm not going to develop an intimacy with God if I'm watching three or four hours of television every night. It's not going to happen. Or if I'm working so many hours that I'm exhausted and that all my energies are spent in the pursuit of my career to the neglect of that relationship with God. And so for Christians living in the world, we really have to examine our, our hearts and look at our lives and ask ourselves some difficult questions. Do I have a relationship with, with God? Where are my thoughts? from moment to moment? How are my energies spent? What, what am I directing my energies towards during the day? And does that touch upon or involve my relationship with God at all? So it's not for nothing that uh, Isaac, uh, Isaac uh, emphasizes silence is the, the beginning of virtue or the fear, fear of God and, uh, and of faith. 
So we withdraw the mind from attractions of, of the world, collect our thoughts uh, into a reflection upon the restitution that is to come. Uh, the goal for us in the spiritual life is a restoration, a full restoration of that relationship with God. And that means a share in the life of the Trinity. And as with Cassian, we have to be clear about our aim, ultimate aim in the spiritual life. Otherwise, we are, could be going off in the wrong direction altogether spiritually. And so we have to have clear in our mind that our goal is intimacy with God to share in the life of the Trinity, that the kingdom of God exists within the heart and the kingdom has come. The kingdom is not of this world. And so our, all of our energies are to be spent <coughs> in that pursuit. If we are anxious about anything, it should be anxious about our relationship with God and living the life of virtue. Uh, strive to enter by the narrow way or the narrow door. And that narrow way is the, the life of the gospel, or to be more specific, the narrow door is Christ himself. And so this is where our attention has to be. Anything on the first paragraph, which we just spent ten minutes on? <laughs> Any comments? Should be fairly familiar, I think. Can you um, familiarize me with the, the fear of God and how it's represented here? Right, and it's being the offspring of faith, too. I think it's important. It's a good question. Uh, I just came across a little quote from Pope Benedict the Sixteenth this past weekend, and he said, "Faith is what uh, frees us from the preoccupation with the self, and also heals us from the malady of a kind of isolation that that preoccupation with the self brings. That faith opens our eyes to the reality of God." and our relationship to him. And so born out of that faith would be fear of God in the sense of acknowledging that God is our creator, that a certain, he's created us for a particular reason and purpose, which is intimacy with him. And so our anxiety should be in the, in the sense of what we should desire to pursue most of all is that relationship and being faithful to him. So faith gives us the clarity of vision to see who we are as human beings and who God is, and so then to pursue the path that is right for us in this life. Uh, St. Francis of Assisi had two little questions that he would often ask himself. Who am I and who are you, God? And faith is the gift that allows us to ask those questions and then to see I am creature, God is creator, I'm created for this intimate relationship with him. The path has been opened up to me in the person of Christ, and that's the path that I'm called to follow. Everything else is an illusion. And it also frees us from a kind of isolation from each other and also from God, that faith allows us to transcend the self in order that we can fulfill the, the two great commandments that we can love God above all things, and we can love our neighbor as ourselves. And so you can see then why fear of God would be an offspring of, of faith. If we have that vision of this reality, it's going to create that striving within us. And I've talked to this group many times before about striving coming from the Greek agon, which from which we get the English word agonize. So we agonize over entering into the kingdom of God and doing God's will, not in the sense of fearing like God is going to exhibit retribution. In fact, this is completely contrary to Isaac's vision of God. God is love. And so when we get to discussing Isaac's vision of Gehenna, I think it's going to knock your socks off because in his mind, the idea of uh, God acting in retribution is contrary to our understanding as, as God as love. 
So fear of God is simply acknowledging the reality of who God is and what turning away from love would really mean for us. He says hell is, we should not make light of Gehenna because it is a painful reality that what should be a healing and joyful thing for us becomes painful, and that is love. And so faith should breed within us this healthy kind of fear that we don't take our life for granted and we don't take it lightly. We see that it, our actions, our decisions, the path that we take is freighted with destiny. And I think so often uh, in the world we just we don't pay attention to our, our our destiny or our dignity in Christ. We live as if we're going to live forever, but within this world, and that we're never going to get old, we're never going to get sick and die, and that our actions have no meaning or lasting value to them. Yeah. I've often brought up that image from. Uh, the commercial of that uh, old age place down in Florida, the villages. Have, have you ever seen that on television? And it's a peculiar kind of thing. It's all these geriatrics in shorts playing softball and you know, d- you know, dancing together and things like that. And it's, and there's nothing wrong with that softball and dancing. And, uh, but uh, it's sort of it's trying to recreate like an adolescent. That's sort of the feeling that you get in watching the commercial is that it's a reversion, a regression to adolescence rather than uh, a picture of old age or someone who has matured in their faith and their preparation and their desire to meet God. And uh, I think our culture as a whole has embraced that, that view. You know, we're per- perpetual adolescents and we live to be entertained, not to serve God. And I think it's pretty hard to read someone like Isaac who, you know, makes it pretty clear to us that Christianity isn't for the faint of heart. You know, it requires a certain courage and a movement away from cowardice to this radical kind of love for God that commits the fullness of one's life. Did I over answer that or fail to answer it? Or <laughs> Okay, paragraph two. <laughs> to lay the foundation of virtue, nothing is better than for a man to contain himself by means of flight from the affairs of life and to persevere in the illumined word of those straight and holy paths, even that word which in the spirit the psalmist named a lamp. So, you know, again, Isaac is writing for monks and uh, also those who embrace a life of radical s- solitude. And so we have to ask ourselves, what, what does this mean for us as we are, are reading uh, Isaac living in the world here in the 21st century? You know, how, how do we uh, contained within ourselves by flight from the affairs of life, the illumined word of God. And again, I think this gets back to our choice of lifestyle. Uh, It doesn't mean that we avoid friendships or that we uh, live in escapist or quietest kind of life, but it does mean moving towards a kind of simplicity. Again, where we can listen to God and place his word at the center of our consciousness, that that becomes our path in our life. He's making reference here uh, to Psalm 119, the word which in the spirit the psalmist named a lamp. The word of the Lord is a lamp to my feet or for my feet, is what Isaac is talking about here. So it's very scripturally focused here, Isaac's writings, that the reading that we do most of all is the Word of God, and to be so immersed in it that it's something that penetrates our depths and forms the, the mind and the heart so that all of our actions flow out, out of that reality. 
that we take we put on the mind of Christ as it were okay and so we have to in some sense remove ourselves from the affairs of the world it's a hard thing because everything is seeking our attention and everything is attractive uh, entertainment we're an entertainment culture we've talked about here in the west in particular we work very hard so that we can enter, enter, entertain ourselves very hard and the idea of seeking our recreation in silence and in solitude can be a foreign thing for us and so to gradually reorder our lives toward God is something that can take time and discipline where we, we begin to let go of things that aren't essential to that relationship. Not just things that are explicitly sinful or evil, but sometimes things that can be benign and maybe have been part of our lives or even a source of joy that those things we will forego in order to open up that space for God and allow that relationship really to grow in a deep and an intimate fashion. I'm not expecting this to be something easy uh, to swallow or to embrace that, you know, I think what we are presented with by Isaac and other Desert Fathers is a Christianity that uh, we see in its rawest form, that they really did step into a new kind of martyrdom. You know, the persecutions had ceased, and so they enter into the desert to do battle with, with Satan, and they enter into a kind of white martyrdom and engage in this battle uh, within the human heart with their own, own passions. And what's revealed to us is the depth of the human psyche, the depth of the human soul. And, you know, often what we find mirrored back to ourselves when we read somebody like Isaac the Syrian can be frightening or jarring uh, because they are such a clear mirror. In fact, one author describes Isaac as exactly that and other monastic writers, a mirror uh, for our generation that we, in our reading of them, we find reflected back to ourselves our own life. You know, what way are we walking? Are we living in the light? Are we really listening to God? Is our conscience really formed by the scriptures? Or have we created a Christ of our own fashioning? And do we embrace the gospel only in in parts, if at all. Any comments on the second paragraph? <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm just enjoying the kinds of things because it is mm -hmm. homiletic, mm -hmm. that it's like images, you know, mm -hmm. that he, he, he's named a light. Right. You know, so this is the only place where there is light. Right. You know, not being called the lamp, but I mean, it's still it's a very, it's a yeah. I'm glad you brought that, brought that up. There's something about the homiletic form that is important. It's meant to awaken desire within us. It's exhortative. You know, preaching in the Catholic tradition or in the Orthodox tradition is not exegetical in, in the sense of being, we might use, you know, commentaries and the most recent studies in order to unpack the meaning of text for us. But it's not meant to be just a word-by-word -word analysis of the text. It's really meant to set our hearts on fire for love of Christ, that we hear the word proclaimed, it inflames our heart then to re receive the word of God made our food and drink in the Eucharist. And so th this is going to be the great thing about reading Isaac over these couple of years is the inflaming of our desire for the Lord and our preparation then to receive him in the Holy Eucharist. And uh, whereas I think in some of our other readings, we had to be a little bit more analytical, uh, you know, try to follow him along over the period of weeks. Whereas here, you know, each week we can be stirred and, and fire for love of the Lord. Yeah, I just mm -hmm. want 
because mm -hmm. of the, these two paragraphs and there's like you know 20 right. megaton things you know he's brought up offspring okay, that's right whose offspring right you know um, Jesus right and seed sown is, is Jesus's own image right okay I mean it's just like you know it doesn't have to go off right while you're hearing it right these are all things that are already in are planted within the heart yeah again I think that's why it's a good thing to read it out loud to to hear it because even what might not register initially is then within the mind and the heart to speak to us at another time when we need or when God uh, deigns it to be so. He said it well. Like you said that it rests in the heart because um, the phrase that keeps resonating I think within my own heart is flight from the affairs of life and I think for myself the idea of the monastic life you know the seed was planted within Cassian, Climacus and now Isaac but you can see or at least I've seen a lot in the people around me that, you know, I kept thinking, well, you need to read with your fathers. You know, it's kind of what I've been saying to a lot of people, and they're just going to look at me. You know, some are like, sure, you know, that sounds great, and most don't. But it's almost like within our gluttonous society, there really is a movement. You know, people, kind of like for the same reason that a lot of these people left the world and, and escaped to the desert, you can see it within the hearts of people around you. You know, if you start asking, I think, the questions, you know, you can kind of pull away from, you need to read the Desert Fathers. It's in the heart, you know, and I can see it in my students who, you know, some of them have been asking to walk out during, you know, secular music sometimes, you know, like on the announcements or even, you know, other people I work with, just seeing that there's more to it than just our job, you know, mm -hmm. and that their family matters or you, you can see a movement. It's almost like when you're faced with such gluttony and such sin and the world is so heavy that, that that God will move in people's hearts. You know, whether or not you read the Desert Fathers or not, I guess. But um, it certainly is a blessing, and I certainly wouldn't be here without it. But he really does work, and it's it's kind of cool to see that it is well, out there, right. you know, that and, people are moving. Right. And to see um, how deeply it is rooted in the scriptures. Yeah. That, and how consistent it is throughout the centuries yeah. as well. I think the problem is, is that we've become disconnected mm -hmm. from the spiritual tradition. And the fact that Christian spirituality is an ascetical spirituality. And we've moved in modern times to a consumerist yeah. spirituality, that it is meant to feed and excite, uh, you know, and, you know, make us feel alive yeah. rather than being something that does purify the heart or does help us to control the passions, to die to self and to sin in order to live. Christ, and when so when you know it becomes a consumerist or consumptive kind of spirituality, we're always looking for ways that the liturgy and spiritual writings can entertain us and engage us, and rather than form us in in accord with the mind of Christ. I apologize because I was getting to a point, but I, okay. I was slow to get there. Um, I guess my question then is, you know, outside of saying read the desert fathers, which is something many, many aren't, don't want to do. What advice, you know, wh I think people need steps to get there. What advice would you give to people who are craving that, but maybe aren't Catholic, Well, who want to leave the world? Maybe they're Christian, maybe they're secular, you know. Come to the oratory. Yeah, <laughs> I, I know, I try. Uh, if it doesn't work, <laughs> I'm not a missionary or good at it. <laughs> read the scriptures, read church yeah. history. It's deeply you know, that. You know, there's no way, you know, this is scripturally oriented, and it mm -hmm. arose out of this deep immersion in the scriptures. So, you know, that's where I would tell a person to begin. That's you know, begin true. with Christ and begin with the Word of God, and then to immerse themselves in the lived reality of the of the church and church history throughout the centuries and you know there's no way around it you can't be lazy and do that I mean it does require a, a willingness to read to study and this is one of the main themes of uh, St. Isaac that we'll come back to again and again how important that is for the formation of the mind and the heart the reading of the fathers and also most importantly the reading of the scriptures to be deeply immersed in the sense of memorizing them.
there's a story about uh, a monastery that had no elder, no, no spiritual father, and yet they had a text of the ascetical homilies, and a novice, you know, got a hold of this text, and every day he started reading a little section and writing on the walls of his cell these phrases of Isaac the Syrian until the whole cell was filled with, you know, writing and sayings from Isaac. And, you know, similarly for us, I mean, we have to immerse ourselves in the study of scriptures and the fathers, memorize it, allow it to be the world in which we live and that shapes our lives. We think, again, we think nothing about immersing ourselves in, you know, people could probably tell you the characters in all these different movies and television shows more than they could quote you something from scripture. And so to make the choice to say, this is going to be my priority, this is where I'm going to spend all of my energies, or the bulk of them, that would radically change the appearance of a person's life. To have you know, the bulk of one's energies being spent on seeking Christ, and to be formed by the scriptures and, and by the writings of the fathers. He could be the way. Yeah. You know, it's, Father, I had mentioned this a number of times before, but when I was a novice, Father Drew gave me was the first three volumes of the Philokalia, and that's how I was exposed to it. And an Orthodox cousin gave me St. John Climacus, and I just started reading them, and that was 30 years ago. And certainly I would never have thought about leading a group 30 years ago on something that I knew nothing about, but it's taken 30 years to have a minimal grasp of, of, the, of the beauty of their teachings and how important it is for the life of a Christian. So a, cho- a choice has to be made. And certainly you've all made it in coming to the group. But it's been a couple of years. You've committed yourself. So by being here, <laughs> You're stuck for the next three years. You've signed. <laughs> okay. Did you have another comment or just okay? But that's where I would begin. I mean, it's and to talk about it. You know, there was there were uh, a group there were a group of uh, guys over at the Presbyterian Seminary who were getting together to read the Desert Fathers, and a bunch of them became Catholic after that. You know, but. Uh, they, they, <laughs> okay, and, you know, they, but they saw the beauty and the wisdom of it and how deeply rooted it was in scripture, and I think that's what took hold of their hearts. Okay, paragraph three, <clears throat> scarcely a man can be found who is able to endure honor, and perhaps such a one cannot be found at all. This, one might say, is because of a man's sudden receptivity to change, even if he be a peer of the angels in his way of life. Now, that might not make any sense at all. And it didn't to me at first. I thought, what in the world is he talking about, especially the enduring honor part? And, um, you know, those who embrace this life of the desert, often became revered teachers and so would attract the attention of others for spiritual guidance and even in the midst of the great theological conflicts within the life of the church would often be you know called out of the desert to to offer you know help and guidance and so Isaac is saying here you know only scarcely a man can be found who can endure honor You know, not allow a kind of honor or prestige, pull him out of the silence and solitude to which he's committed himself. Now, again, obviously, Isaac is talking about men who have embraced a life, the life of an anchorite, and and so their commitment (laughs) is to remain, stay in your cell, and your cell will teach you everything. Stay in the silence, and there you will hear God. And so the temptation, the grave temptation for them would be inconstancy. 
to allow the inconstancy that often arises within our hearts, the uneasiness that often will pull us in all kinds of directions, to pull them out of their commitment. So scarcely would there be one who would be found who could endure honor. The moment that somebody says, can you come and give a talk, you know, to my, at my church or my group, and then, you know, he's running all over the countryside doing that, but he's not, no longer living as a monk. Uh, in the introduction to one of these works, uh, there was an abbot of a monastery who's appro approached by a monk uh, in London, uh, at a talk, and a monk comes up to him and wants to speak to him, but it's you know the uh, uh, it's come towards nighttime. It's the vigil, you know, before uh, of, of of the Sabbath, and says that he'll meet him tomorrow. And the monk wanted to talk to him uh, about one of the Desert Fathers. I think it was even Isaac the Syrian, or it was just one of the Desert Fathers. I think it was, and. He asked him where he was from, and the monk was from Mount Athos, and he had come to, to London to hear this man speak and to study at a university in London, the fathers of the church. And this monk was like, you came to London to study the fathers, and you're from Mount Athos. Mm -hmm. Have you not read Isaac the Syrian's distinction? between the, the various forms of knowledge. And then he lays it all out for him. And the monk had never heard about it. And uh, so, you know, that can be our, our problem, that we will, you know, want to flit to different things or pr uh, run to things that seem to uh, garner greater uh, honor or attention in the world. Uh, I must have posted this thing about the group of Isaac the Syrian a thousand times. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, not go it's never going to, there aren't going to be 60 people here studying, you know, Isaac the Syrian. It's just one of those things. It's, uh, it's a difficult road. And, but here we have available to us uh, the depth of holiness that's rooted in the love of Christ and we don't need to, to run to different places in order to be fed and nourished upon the deepest wisdom. And certainly that monk didn't have to leave Mount Athos to go study in London, you know, to be, be formed in the deepest wisdom of all. And so, you know, there is an inconstancy here that I think... Uh, Isaac the Syrian puts his finger on that is important here for us even to, to think about that uh, we can be driven out of our silence and out of that solitude by any number of, of things to, that sort of attach themselves to our attention or that seem uh, more interesting to us. Uh, and certainly more interesting than silence. You know, time spent in the chapel almost seems like wasted time. And not to be in deep silence and solitude uh, where we are allowing God to speak a word to us that is equal to himself is not going to be experienced by us as something that's fulfilling on a, a basic human level. We are draw being drawn into the mystery and the wonder of the Godhead and allowing God to speak to, him, to us as God is in himself. And that means a willingness to enter into that silence and to stay put. And yet we are going to be tempted out of that or we are going to be experience boredom. We're going to become restless or lazy and not want to remain within that. The silence that we would have is almost, you know, is more important than the, even the reading of Isaac the Syrian. You know, what we would hear in a silence that is directed towards God and is strengthened by faith is going to be far more valuable to us. I just had this sort of thought. 
how many times that we know of in scripture that Christ himself went off to speak to our Father to be in silence. He would not be with the apostles and with the crowds and he had he thirsts to be alone with 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 God. And we're mere human beings, right? And we think we can have a relationship with our Father with all the noise and everything going on and we don't reach out for that silence and right. solitude. Well, I think it allows us to feel like we have a sense of control that we can shape that relationship in a way that we are, are comfortable with. To fall into the hands of the living God is a fearful thing. And so we can end up avoiding that silence in order to avoid hearing what God is saying to us. And so I think we can turn Christianity very quickly into something you know, into, again, the social gospel where we make the our Christianity about the things that we are doing, which is certainly a part of the faith. We are attentive to others and their, their need and their suffering. But we can neglect, you know, at the same time, neglect that deeper relationship with God and let ourselves focus on those things uh, because that can actually be more comfortable to us. You know, to fall into a kind of activism. All right. The beginning of the path of life is continually to exercise the mind in the words of God and to live in poverty. For when a man waters himself with one, it aids in the perfection of the other. That is to say, to water yourself with the study of the words of God helps you in achieving poverty while achieving freedom from possessions affords you time to attain to constant study of the words of God. And the help provided by them both speedily erects the entire edifice of the virtues. So, you know, if we embrace a kind of poverty, say, if we simplify our lives, and in order to be able to open up that time to study, the scripture. You know, he's not speaking here of uh, only possessions, although possessions are often the things that distract us, that we either have to continue to work very hard in order to maintain them or to get more, or we just, the more possessions we have, the more focus we get on them, and they become our idols, they become our God. But I think also with our time, if we embrace the poverty by not entertaining ourselves and engaging in everything that the world throws before us, allow ourselves to embrace the poverty of silence and enter into that and to study the word of God, then one waters the other and the two together then build, he says, the entire edifice of virtue. That's a pretty powerful statement and it's a very simple one, you know, to have even that as the role of one's life. I'm going to study the scriptures and I'm going to em embrace a kind of poverty where I set aside these distractions and I simplify myself and embrace, simplify my life and embrace the poverty of, of, of the silence. Because at that point, none of my senses are being fed with anything. You know, we're constantly in this state of receptivity. And if we silence all of that to listen to God, we're going to experience a kind of deep, poverty in it and want, and maybe even want to flee it but if we allow that to take place and then in that study the scripture then there's going to be a, a great growth in, in virtue we lay the entire foundation he tells us for the, the spiritual life and the life of holiness by doing those two things not easy things but Two of them. Any thoughts about that? I thought that was pretty profound. The constant study of the Word of God, you know, memorizing it, not just hearing the one little snippet at Mass on Sunday, but daily immersing ourselves in it and 
memorizing parts and if not the whole thing. Psalm that I just turned it into say God looks for those who are looking for Him. Mm -hmm. So it's right. even even a, <laughs> a wonderful assurance, right? You know, to I think it's Psalm sixty nine. But anyway, it's not what it says in Psalm sixty nine. I, I turned yeah. it around. And in essence, I think this is what he's saying too. The the more that we look to God and seek Him and knock, you know. It will be open unto us, the thing that we're seeking. But it's not the things of the world. I think when we hear that gospel, I think it's actually to Mars gospel, isn't it? Seek and you will find, knock and it will be open to it. What's the, I'm sorry, I should know this. Ask and you will receive. And But it's the spirit that we will receive, he says. It's not the things of this world. But I think when we hear that, we're thinking, well, if I pray for this, I should receive this. But <laughs> so it's the Spirit of God who wants that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just uh, maybe one little section more. No one can draw nigh to God save the man who has separated himself from the world. But I call separation not the departure of the body, but departure from the world's affairs. The world's affairs, not God's affairs. Again, we're not being called to a kind of quietism or escapism, but not allowing ourselves to be drawn into the affairs of the world in such a way that it pulls us away from our, from our Lord. This is virtue, that in his mind a man should be unoccupied with the world as long as the senses have dealings with external things, the heart cannot have rest from imaginations about them. Outside of the desert and solitude, the bodily passions do not abate, nor do evil thoughts cease. Now, you know, this idea of setting aside thoughts, imaginations, uh, this is a hard thing, you know. Sheila, Sheila was saying, you know, how do you get people to read the Desert Fathers when they're saying things like this? You know, set aside the affairs of the world and imaginations. And without this, there's no overcoming the passions. But how does a generation, say, immersed in uh, a pornographic culture, unless it separates itself from the affairs of that in a radical way, and not allow the thoughts to go and, and form the imagination around those things? expect them to grow in virtue. There has to be a radical asceticism there. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Well, if you're constantly going to be looking at pornography, you're going to fill your, your mind and imagination with things that then inflame the passions and lead you in to sin. It's only by cutting, you know, plucking out the eye and cutting off the hand. You stop you have to go, as it were, cold turkey uh, until it becomes the reality that you've separated yourself from the thing that's leading you in sin. And again, there's a kind of poverty in that. We, we are making a choice to, to do things in our life that may leave us even feeling scarred, that I've cut things out of my life that everybody else seems to be participating in. And so I, I feel like I'm not part of that group and that can be a difficult thing to do but we can't be under the illusion that the passions will will abate and you know so if we are going back again and again and confessing the same things over and over again we, we need to look closely at our life and saying you know am I really making the sacrifices that I need here in order to foster the kind of virtue that God is calling me to? And am I really praying in a way, not just in a way that I think is sufficient or even a lot, but am I praying in the way that God is calling me to pray? 
in order that I might be strengthened by his grace. Until the soul becomes drunk with faith in God by receiving a perception of the power of faith, she can neither heal the malady of the senses nor be able forcibly to tread visible matter underfoot, which is the barrier to things that are within and beyond perception by the senses. Uh, this is a theme that will come up uh, a great deal in Isaac, that of inebriation in, in the faith, you know, being drunk with love for God. And, you know, if we're constantly drinking the word of God and, uh, you know, drinking in, as it were, the love of God through our prayer life, we are going to become, you know, drunk with love, inebriated. That's, you know, we're not going to be able to uh, pursue the things of this world. Uh, but until that becomes the case, until we have this perception of faith, we're not going to be able to tread underfoot the, the things that plague us, the passions. We all know what it is to be in love, you know, to be passionate about things. But, you know, can we say that about our, our relationship with God, that we've pursued it to such an extent that we've meditated upon the cross, that we get caught up, and this is another theme of Isaac, the wonder of what God, of God's love for us, of all that he's given us through the incarnation, through the cross, through the sacramental life. Do we allow ourselves to get caught up in the, the wonder of that and, and so become inebriated with the love of God? That this is, we're intoxicated with his love. That should, that should be our, our goal, goal. And again, you know, we're not in control when we're inebriated. And we like to be very much in control, I think, with even in the living out of our faith life. So to be drunk with love for the Lord, you know, nobody knows what they're going to do when they're not inhibited. <laughs> we might do something stupid, like give our lives fully to the Lord. <laughs> Uh, if we, you know, drink too much of the of the spirit, mm -hmm. so we want, you know, you to mention his name in huh? secular society, right? <laughs> Very dangerous. <laughs> Driving under the influence, <laughs> <laughs> living our living our lives under the influence of the grace of God, and so to to want to control that, you could see how powerful that can be to remain restrained, to say, okay, I don't want to be a fanatic here, even though we're willing to be fanatics about the Pittsburgh Steelers or the Penguins or whatever it might be. But when it comes to Jesus, we don't, you know, we don't want to go there because we think, what will he ask me to do? What path might I have to follow? How might I have to be called to love and give myself in love? Any thoughts or final comments? In an hour, we made it through five paragraphs of a homily. <laughs> Just think how long it's going to take us to get through this book. <laughs> so what do you think of Isaac? Any initial impressions? No? He writes exceptionally well. Mm -hmm. For those who enjoy visuals, mm -hmm. I feel yes. like he's the easiest to follow. Mm -hmm. I think hom homilies lend themselves to that, so hopefully that will be true throughout. His images are interesting, though. They're kind of complicated. Like the one with um, the watering yourself is, is a plant, but then that it, it erects an edifice, mm -hmm. and a plant isn't normally an edifice, so it's like, a, it's like living stones. It's like a living, breathing, changing, growing building, right. which is really cool. It's not... Mm -hmm. It's not just like uh, corny analogies taken up to their natural end, like, you know, water yourself up, you have to look this, and you'll become a beautiful two-branch tree. Like, it's, it's, uh, it communicates so much more, like, it's so thoughtful. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. really cool. But some powerful themes have already come out for us.
remember, wonder, inebriation, those are very key as we, we go through. Okay. So we'll stop there for the evening, and we'll pick up here next Wednesday. And as always, let's close with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Lord be with you. And my God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.